nice and sharp. I want to get to work right away if I get the chance. Good luck. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. It's a year after Sherlock Holmes first appeared in print. You've got the Victorian gaslit streets of London. You've also got the appeal of the name, Jack the Ripper. The murders became famous. Once the name Jack the Ripper had been invented, they became a total sensation. It was not enough only that the woman should be killed, but also should be mutilated. Uh, be sure about that every part of the body should be, uh, should be hacked together. They were the first sexual serial murders to occur in a major town, a leading capital city, and they were the first to achieve international publicity. In the history of American crime, what fascinates people is not the murders themselves, it's the puzzle. Who? Who did it? Why weren't they caught? And it's that puzzle which teases everybody. City of commerce, culture, and high fashion. A society of wealthy gentlemen in top hats and cutaways. Their wives, gentle ladies. Their children, tended by nannies. <laughs> Queen Victoria reigns supreme. In contrast, the East End where 900,000 impoverished people lived in cramped, filthy slums, and entire families were homeless. Whitechapel, the most destitute area of all, is where the murders took place. This outcast community was ignored and reviled by Victorian London. The East End, having become a dirty, run-down industrial district, now, in a time of economic depression at the end of the 1880s, was an area of overcrowding, misery and unemployment, and an area where at any time almost any woman might have to prostitute herself as the only way to feed her children. I've talked to person after person from the East End today who said, yes, they always reckoned Grandma had to go out on the streets when time was bad, and nobody thought any of the worse of her for it. The life of these women, one tends to sometimes forget, is just how brutal and how harsh it was. You could buy one of these women for three pennies, or two pennies, or a loaf of stale bread. The price of three pennies was fixed because that was what the women would pay for a large glass of gin. I just wrote to say you would be glad to know I am settled in my new place and going all right up to now. They are very nice people and I have not much to do. I hope you're all right and the boy has work. So goodbye now for the present. Yours truly, Polly. Answer soon, please. And uh, let me know how you are. Polly Nichols was murdered on the 31st of August, 1888. And on that particular day, she'd had three customers. She'd spent the money on gin. So when she turned up at the lodging house to get a bed for the night, not only was she drunk, but she didn't have any money for a bed, but she felt pretty confident about getting a fourth customer because she thought she looked particularly attractive. And the reason she thought she looked so attractive was because she was wearing a new hat. I mean, she was drunk, she's got five front teeth missing, but she was wearing this new hat. And the last words of the lodging house keeper were, see what a jolly bonnet I'm wearing. August the 31st, 1888, was the first Ripper murder. Mary Ann Nichols, known as Polly, 
a streetwalker in her early 40s, was found dead in Bucks Row, Whitechapel, at approximately a quarter to four in the morning. She had been dead approximately 20 minutes when she was found, and in the mortuary, they discovered that not only had her throat been cut, but there was a great gash in her abdomen. Now, these murders became very famous for a most peculiar reason. The very first elections to the London County Council were taking place, and the radicals, the extreme leftists, thought they had a very good chance of winning the East End. The radical newspapers, particularly the Star and the Pall Mall Gazette, two London evening newspapers, realized that if they wrote up the murders, they could draw attention to the terrible social conditions of the East End, and they did. And they sold more papers than anybody had thought possible. As far as the public attention was concerned, you could say that journalists were absolutely responsible for part of the fear and the fervor. When you look at the papers of the time, you see the lurid front page illustrations on police news and equally lurid uh, treatment of the subject on the inside. Even the Times fell for it. Even the Times was swept away by ripper fervor and ripper fever. A nameless reprobate. Off beast, off man is it though. Deadly, cunning. Insatiable thirst for blood. If you could take my unit and I back to 1888, to the crime scene, uh, I would suggest that we focus in on the first homicide. Generally, the first homicide is the focal point, is the area where the subject feels the most comfortable. And that would be the area where either he is employed or where he resides. I believe the subject would go back to the scene, go back there and kind of hang around there and fantasize and relive the crime. You could have situations where the murderer's standing here, the victim's lying there, the murderer's covered in the victim's blood, he's left his fingerprints and handprints all over the murder scene. There's no way you could combine the two. The scientific knowledge didn't exist for that to happen. So literally, you have got to uh, catch the murderer in the act of murder. On the 8th of September, 1888, at 10 to 6 in the morning, the second victim was found. She had been kicked out of her nearby lodging house at midnight for not having the money she needed to pay for her bed. She expected to earn it, but clearly didn't find it as she was last seen alive at a quarter past five, negotiating with a client who was probably Jack the Ripper on the pavement outside number 29 Hanbury Street. Her throat had been cut she had been savagely mutilated, disemboweled, and her uterus taken away. If ever the Ripper was going to be caught, it was, it was then. Because they're out in the backyard, and a man in the next door house comes down to the yard, obviously, to relieve himself, because this is what the yards were used for. And he's standing there, and he hears something fall against the fence, and a woman's voice say, no. Now, the fence is only five foot high. All he's got to do is look over the fence, and he would have seen Chapman with her killer, with a ripper. In these extraordinarily difficult cases, where a roaming sexual killer attacks people he doesn't know, so you can't follow up people's associates, if he attacks prostitutes, he's attacking women who automatically go off to dark corners with half a dozen strange men every day. How on earth are you going to find which one is doing the killing? I think... By Victorian standards, the investigation into the series of Whitechapel murders was conducted as well as possibly they could manage in those days. They put extra manpower on the streets. They had intensive door-to-door uh, -door inquiries. All leads were followed up, even ridiculous leads. Prostitutes described a local man who had been threatening them. Well, he's short and he's stocky and he's got the blackest hair and a black moustache and a thickest neck you ever saw. He's got a cap and, like, a leather apron and he waves his knife about and he shouts, I'll rip you up! When the Ripper murders began, the Metropolitan Police, they rapidly announced that although they couldn't name him, they didn't even know his name, their principal suspect was a local poor Polish-Jewish immigrant, nicknamed Leather Apron. Scotland Yard quickly arrested John Pizer as Leather Apron in order to stop the press from printing inflammatory articles about an immigrant man threatening London women. There was no evidence implicating Pisa in the murders, and he was quickly released. But the incident fed ethnic tensions in the East End. 
The Irish were resented by the native English. The Irish themselves resented the new influx of Jewish immigrants who settled particularly in the parish of Whitechapel because that was where the ancient two synagogues of London had always been. And they were racing in, fleeing the pogroms of Russia and Bismarck's clearances of Jews in Silesia. Onto that Jewish community is projected the idea that it's a Jew that is a, the murder, the ripper, the murderer, because no Englishman, no Eastender, would actually have committed such a crime. So the Jews are already becoming, the, the, the immigrant Jew is becoming the scapegoat and the suspect for the ripper murders. The police next turned their sights on doctors who performed amputations and surgery. Perhaps the killer who extracted organs from his victims was a doctor. It is apparently an amputation knife, a late 19th century amputation knife. And certainly uh, it's the sort of weapon which uh, could, have done the, could, could have done the murders. A number of medical students whose brains had been unhinged were being sought after. And in fact, there was a time when to be a doctor and to carry a, a bag around made you an enormously suspicious person. The idea that the Ripper was a doctor came from one and one only of the medics who examined the bodies. Dr. Baxter Phillips, after examining Annie Chapman's body, said this was the work of an expert. The abdomen had been entirely laid open. The intestines, severed from their mesenteric attachments, had been lifted out of the body and placed on the shoulder of the corpse, whilst the pelvis, the uterus, and its appendages had been entirely obviously the work of an expert, of one at least who had such knowledge of anatomical examinations as to be enabled to secure the pelvic organs with one sweep of the knife. The people at the top had the medical evidence surveyed by Dr. Bond of Westminster, a police surgeon they trusted implicitly, and Bond's full report on all the medical evidence in the case said no skill at all, not even the skill of a butcher. After two ghastly murders, many concerned citizens wrote letters to Scotland Yard suggesting ways to catch the murderer. The most popular idea was to have armed police pose as prostitutes. Then, on September 29, a note arrived, purportedly from the killer himself. The signature was brilliant. Dear boss, I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me just yet. That joke about a leather apron gave me real fits. I'm down on oars and I shan't quit ripping them till I do get buckled. Scotland Yard was now very fearful that the mysterious Whitechapel fiend would soon strike again. My knife's so nice and sharp, I want to get to work right away if I get the chance. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. The name, Jack the Ripper probably invented by a journalist, certainly first appearing in the Dear Boss letter, but what a name for an undiscovered ghoul. Charles Warren, head of Scotland Yard, was under siege. The killer was still at large. The superiors were furious, and the public had no confidence in him. The radical press wanted him out. One square mile in the centre of London had its own police force. The City of London Police and its Commissioner, Major Henry Smith, were about to be drawn into the hunt for Jack the Ripper. Hastel reinforcements were put into the area, and also, it seems silly now, uh, although I'm sure the intention was well meant, notice was given out advising the prostitutes to stay off the street. 24 hours later, the worst fears of the police were realised. victim that night was Elizabeth Stride, nicknamed Long Liz. She had been seen hustling for trade up and down a little road called Berners Street in the East End during the evening from 11pm. Her body was found at about one o'clock 
in Dutfield's Yard, a little opening off Berners Street. Her throat had been cut, but she'd not been mutilated. And it is thought that the Ripper may have been frightened off by hearing Dean Schutz's pony and trap approaching. Murder slipped out from behind the gateway, headed west, and crossed the invisible boundary. We're not, we're no big wall or ditch to jump. It's just crossing from one side of the street to the other. Crosses from Scotland Yard territory into the city. It is there, then, he picks up the second prostitute that night, uh, a prostitute called Catherine Eddowes. Night, old cock. The second murder on the night of the double murders was that of Catherine Eddowes. Her body was found at about a quarter to two in Mitre Square in the city of London. She had been appallingly mutilated, her throat cut, V's cut in her cheeks, pointing up to the eyes, her eyelids nicked through, the tip of her nose cut off, and the usual ripping and abdominal mutilation, with her uterus and one kidney taken away by the man. Now, nobody has seen or heard a thing. Not the policeman on the beat, the policeman and his family, in the house opposite, the night porter with a door partly open. They didn't actually have to see the square or be present on it because Mitre Square had an echo on it. He's now killed once on Scotland Yard territory, Metropolitan Police territory. He's now killed once on City of London Police ter territory. So you've got search parties coming from both directions looking for him. And he's in between. I mean, he's very confident, he's very arrogant. Commissioner Smith of the London Police immediately assigned men to the case. He was not about to be criticised as incompetent and hopeless as press cartoons portrayed his counterpart, Sir Charles Warren. At the same time, 4,500 East End women who were concerned about brothels and raucous taverns in Whitechapel signed an impassioned letter to the Queen. Madam, we the women of East London feel horror at the dreadful sins that have been lately committed in our midst and grief because of the shame that has fallen on our neighbourhood. We have learnt much of the lies of those of our sisters who have lost a firm hold on goodness and who are living sad and degraded lives. We would also beg that your majesty will call on your servants in authority and bid them put the law which already exists in motion to close bad houses within whose walls such wickedness is done and men and women ruined in body and soul. We are, madam, your loyal and humble servants. There was a feeling that what happened to these women deserved to happen to them. The average Victorian regarded a prostitute as a gay woman. Now, they use the word gay not in the sense that we mean it to use it today as meaning homosexual. They use the word gay as meaning nymphomania. Prostitutes were all nymphomaniacs. That was why they were prostitutes. Therefore, they were on the streets for their pleasure. The fact that they were there out of sheer economic desperation and necessity is rarely considered. Um, therefore, they're on the streets for their pleasure. The wages of sin is death. Therefore, what happened to them? Deserved to happen. So, so why waste too much time over these women? It's another piece of street cleaning. After the murder of Catherine Eddowes, women in the West End feared for their lives. The Ripper was both bloodthirsty and unpredictable. This was someone who was killing individuals, but was clearly sending a message to society generally, so that everyone begins to perceive him as talking to them directly. And that's, again, that's the, that's the, that's the change that happens. It's when the, when the killer suddenly realizes, I'm, I'm only killing one person at a time, but in a way I am assaulting society. 15,000 constables man the streets. 1,500 undercover detectives prowl the docks in Covent Garden, including a director of the Bank of England, who disguised himself as a common labourer. Out of necessity, the sneaker was invented. In common with hundreds of others, I was drafted there and we patrolled the streets, usually in pairs, without tangible result. We did, however, rather anticipate a great commercial invention. To our clumsy regulation boots, we nailed strips of rubber and so ensured some measure of silence when walking. Unfortunately, the inquiry was under two separate directions. The city police, with their involvement with Catherine Eddowes' murder, the one 
canonical murder that took place in the city held a separate investigation. And although the two forces were supposed to liaise and did liaise quite well at ground level, the chiefs didn't get on and the chiefs did not properly exchange information. Soon, citizens took matters into their own hands. We know that the vigilante groups arrested people on the streets. We get accounts of people being taken to stations and obviously embarrassed police officers having to arrest a uh, sort of quite respectable gentleman uh, out on the street. Possibly too, they, they, they released uh, the Ripper on occasion. Uh, it's speculation, but um, uh, nonetheless, it, 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 is, it is something to be considered. George Lusk, head of the Whitechapel Vigilante Committee, received a letter posted from hell, probably from the real killer. The syntax was clearly Irish, and the envelope contained parts of a human kidney. Mr. Lusk, sir, I send you half a kidney I took from one woman, preserved it for you. To the piece I fried and ate it, it was very nice. I may send you the bloody knife that took it out, if you'll only wait a while longer. Catch me when you can, Mr. Lusk. 32-year-old Irish-born socialist and critic George Bernard Shaw wrote one of his famous letters to the press. Less than a year ago, the West End was literally clamoring for the blood of the people hounding Sir Charles Warren to thrash and muzzle the scum who dared to complain that they were starving, behaving in short as the property class always does behave when the workers throw it into a frenzy of terror by venturing to show their teeth. Whilst conventional Democrats were wasting our time on education, agitation, and organization, some independent genius has taken the matter in hand. A murdering fiend called Jack the Ripper had killed four women. How many more would die before he was through? It escalates, it constantly escalates, and we see this more clearly probably in the Ripper case than in anything else. The constant escalation of mutilation. You've got the murderer, he's now working to some time to blow of his own. It goes like this. 31st of August, he kills Polly Nichols. 8th of September, he kills Annie Chapman. 30th of September is the double event, he kills Stride and Eddowes. 8th of October, nothing happens. 30th of October, nothing happens. The night of the 8th, 9th of November, he meets his fifth and final victim. And this is this young prostitute called, called, called Mary Kelly. of the 8th, 9th of November, it's raining, she's out on the street, she's looking for customers. She picks one up around about midnight, takes him back to her room, and one of the other prostitutes sees her drawing the curtains of her room, and as she did so, Kelly is singing a musical song. It was only a violet I plucked from my mother's grave. Around about half past three in the morning, she picks up the ripper. Some people living in Miller's Court hear a faint cry of murder. It's almost certain that it was at that point that the Ripper lying on the bed beside Mary Kelly throws the sheet over her head and makes his first thrust through the sheet with a knife. He has several hours to work over. She had been absolutely savagely mutilated, almost cut to pieces, her abdomen entirely emptied and the contents left scattered around on the bed beside her. Pieces of flesh had been left on a table beside the bed. Her heart had been extracted from her thorax and it is possible from the way the doctor described this that that was taken away. There is the photograph of um, the murder. She's lying on the bed facing the window. You can just see the puff sleeves of her chemise. This is what confronts uh, the police when they get there to begin the investigation. News of Mary Kelly's savage death stunned the world. And a forced murder in London in Whitechapel. Nothing in the history of American crime can, for special horror, be said to outmatch heat and butcher. The horrendous murder of Mary Kelly alarmed Buckingham Palace and greatly distressed Queen Victoria. She promptly telegrammed her Prime Minister with an urgent message. This new, most ghastly murder shows the absolute necessity for some very decided action. 
all the courts must be lit and our detectives improved. Sir Charles Warren, the beleaguered head of Scotland Yard, was already on his way out. The fifth Ripper murder sealed his fate and he resigned. That must have been another great high for him. I did all this. I caused this sensation. It is my doing. And again, it feeds the vanity and the arrogance. 12th of November, 1888. My name is Joseph Barnett. I reside at Mary Kelly's lover, Joseph Barnett, was summoned by the coroner to identify what was left of her decimated body. I have lived with the deceased one year and eight months. Her name was Marie Jeanette Kelly. I have seen the body. I identify her by the ear and the eyes. Now, the Ripper had killed five women in ever-increasing acts of violence. Scotland Yard and the city police kept extra forces on the street and continued to search for the Phantom of Death. The police at the time were hampered. They were hampered by the fact that they had no experience of sexual serial murders. They had no files to look at. They had no reliable consultants who could come along and say, it'll be a man like this, look for this sort of man. They were, therefore were looking for the traditional madman, someone who was, say, foaming at the mouth or had a vacant stare. If I was conducting an interrogation of this individual back then, I probably would focus in on the fact, if it was Jack, say, hey, Jack, I know you got blood on you, Jack. I know you got blood on you. It's not a question of whether or not you did it or not. I know you did it but I know you got blood on you. I think you can say Jack the Ripper was cunning rather than clever. Clever he may have been, we just don't know. But certainly he had luck on his side and must have had a degree of animal cunning to escape the police net. Five women had been brutally killed and still nobody could name the man who had committed the crimes. Four years later, in 1892, the file was closed on Jack the Ripper. Two years later, Sir Neville McNaughton, senior official of Scotland Yard, wrote a memorandum stating the three chief suspects he believed might have been the Ripper. No one ever saw the Whitechapel murderer. Many homicidal maniacs were suspected, but no shadow of proof could be thrown on any case. I may mention the case of three men. Mr M. Druitt, said to be of good family, who disappeared at the time of the Miller's Court murder, whose body was found in the Thames about seven weeks after that murder. He was sexually insane, and from private information, I have little doubt that his own family believed him to be the murderer. Michael Ostrog, a Russian doctor and a convict, who was subsequently detained in a lunatic asylum as a homicidal maniac. Kuzminski, a Polish Jew and resident of Whitechapel. He had a great hatred of women, especially of the prostitute class. He was removed to a lunatic asylum in March of 1889. McNaughton's memorandum was published in 1915, and ever since, criminologists have debated its merits. Chief Anderson of the Metropolitan Police wrote that the Ripper had been positively identified. He was a local Jewish man, picked up after the final murder and put into an insane asylum. He could not be named or tried because he had gone insane and was unable to defend himself. When you search the asylum records looking for an immigrant patient from Whitechapel who fits, there is only one who fits with the timing of the end of the murders and that is a man called David Cohen 23 years old, who was taken by the Metropolitan Police because he had had a fit of raving mania and they picked him up on the streets. He was taken by the police four weeks after the last murder. It looks as though David Cohen was the man they believed was Jack the Ripper. While 19th century police believed that a serial killer was a homicidal maniac, this view would be expanded in the 20th century, when 70 more suspects would be named as Jack the Ripper. The name Jack the Ripper has come to symbolize terror the world over. Stories about this phantom of death are so compelling that even the great master of the macabre, Alfred Hitchcock, based his very first film on the well-known tale of a lodger, mistakenly thought to be the Ripper. 
In his film, Jack is called the Avenger. In 1932, director Morris Elvey produced his version of the same plot, The Phantom Fiend. You stay here. Show us the room. Come along. Movies entertain us with Jack the Ripper mythology, but theories abound. Speculation is fair game. I could give you a lovely story that Oscar Wilde was Jack the Ripper. Nobody's ever suggested it, but take it from me, he wasn't. The only person who hasn't been dragged in yet, and uh, well, I'm just waiting for it to happen, I've thrown out a few in, is Florence Nightingale uh, and Queen Victoria herself. Both of those are, are completely um, out of the score for the moment, but just wait. Cream has been put forward as a suspect uh, for Jack the Ripper, although he was in prison in Illinois in the in the USA at the time of the Ripper murders, which I think writes him off conclusively. The cream theory originates from the fact that the hangman, Billington, whilst on the scaffold hanging cream, heard the words, I'm Jack the, as the trapdoor was sprung, and then it was cut off by the rope. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of Sherlock Holmes, speculated on a Jill the Ripper. If a man was in disguise as a midwife, he could move about the streets with blood-stained clothes, undetected. Chapman does remain a plausible suspect. He was, of course, a different sort of killer when apprehended at the turn of the century. He was poisoning wives. Now, this is a far cry from a lust killer murdering prostitutes. If you are fascinated with the mystery of Jack the Ripper, you are a Ripperologist. Using modern FBI profile techniques is one tool this historian used to focus on self-proclaimed Dr. Rosalind Donston as a very plausible Ripper. It started with his wielding a sword when he was 18 years old as a surgeon and soldier in Giuseppe Garibaldi's Italian campaign in 1855. And bit by bit, after a long period, as I managed to find out about his service with Garibaldi, I managed to find out his medical experience, I managed to find out his association with prostitutes, I managed to find that five people independently at a later date were pointing to him as the Ripper, or potentially the Ripper. Most important of all, in 1896, W.T. Stead, the former editor of the Palomar Gazette that Johnston used to write for, actually in print in his magazine border said that for a whole year, I believed him to be the veritable Jack the Ripper. Donston was in the perfect location to perpetrate the murders. He placed himself as a patient in the London hospital, located a few blocks from Bucks Row, scene of the first murder. His actual capacity to become a, a, a serial killer died, of course, with his uh, failure in health. He was no longer, after 1889, capable of another cycle of murders. The theories that intrigue people the most involve the Royal House of Windsor. It is a shocking thought that a member of the monarchy, the head of a great nation, could actually be involved in the crimes of Jack the Ripper. It all centers on this man, the black sheep of the royal household. Prince Edward Albert, Duke of Clarence was grandson of Queen Victoria and heir to the throne. Physically weak and poor in his studies, he was a target of gossip, especially about his sexuality. He died in 1892 of influenza or syphilis. The stories vary. theories began in earnest when Sir Thomas Stowell published an article in 1970 stating that Sir William Gull, physician to the Queen, committed the murders with the Prince, who was in the delusionary stage of syphilis and was somehow compelled to slaughter prostitutes. And in that way, you know, leaps and bounds, almost like a fantasy game, the Duke of Clarence was dragged in for the first time. That immediately attracted worldwide attention because anything to do with the royal family sells newspapers. Then, in 1973, a bizarre new twist. The prince had fathered a daughter with an East End Catholic woman. 
skull and Freemasons covered up for the prince. And the whole thing was a Masonic conspiracy to save the crown because the Duke of Clarence had done something he shouldn't have done. He had married a Roman Catholic lady and had a child by her, and that was, that was death for the royal family. So, in fact, all the people who knew about it had to be eliminated. There were five prostitutes. According to that theory, Gull and the Prince rode through Whitechapel in a coach and sought out Mary Kelly and the four other prostitutes. They mutilated the bodies and lay them on the street to be found by the police. The most recent theory involves a brilliant but strange young man, J.K. Stephen. He was hired as a tutor for Prince Eddie. The royal family had no idea about that uh, J.K. Stephen was a homosexual and had personal problems. And they developed a very strong relationship between them. Very strong. When the prince became engaged to marry, an infuriated Stephen went on a murderous rampage of prostitutes, with Prince Eddie as his lookout. J.P. Stephen, who I think was Jack the Ripper, was a loner to some extent. And when he was more than a lust murder, he really wanted to kill the woman piece by piece. If any of these theories are true, there was a cover-up of majestic proportions. That the heir to the English throne was either an accomplice to the Ripper murders or Jack the Ripper himself is the stuff of bestsellers and television movies. A few years ago, a diary surfaced that has caused much debate and great excitement. James Maybrick supposedly wrote that he committed the Ripper murders. James Maybrick was a Liverpool cotton merchant who died in 1889 and whose wife was convicted on very dubious evidence of having poisoned him. A journal turned up in Liverpool in 1992 which purported to be Maybrick's and to be a confession that he was Jack the Ripper. Very few of us believe it. The diary is not in Maybrick's handwriting. There is internal evidence to suggest that it is not a genuine piece of work with knowledge of the murders, and an examination of the inks appears likely to show, in the long run, that it is definitely a modern forgery. He fails in too many ways. He just fails the test. But again, it's one of those tantalizing, every time you hear something new and you hear about a new possibility, you jump at it hoping, you know, this is the one. We're going to find out who he was. I think there is evidence about, but people don't always realize whether they've got, simply because the legends are taken over, the films blur the issue. I mean, I've been astonished at the number of people, for instance, uh, they, they, they look at the Michael Caine film, Jack the Ripper, and say, oh, the mystery, the mystery solved. It's not. I mean, the whole thing, about 99% of it is fiction. But for a lot of people, that's the solution to the case. So, therefore, if they do come across evidence, if they do come across documentation, they're not going to put it forward because they think the mystery has been solved. It hasn't. And that's one of the things we need to sort of get over, that we are still looking for the identity of Jack the Ripper. Nobody really knew what was within him. Nobody knew what he was thinking. Nobody knew his feelings. And at the same time also, he was afraid that he might be discovered. Which was one reason as to why he, 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 was, he couldn't be found. There is a brand new suspect for Jack the Ripper, the Phantom of Death, who terrorized London more than a hundred years ago. He is an Irish-American outlaw who outfoxed Scotland Yard in London and New York. This American was at large in London at the time of the murders. The police were seeking him at the height of the murders. He was arrested after the Miller's Court murder, at which time, of course, the murders ceased. He escaped from England in early December 1888 and got back to America and was never arrested by Scotland Yard, despite the fact that they sent a team of detectives to America to try and catch him. A letter with an undisputed provenance is the source of this new information. The letter in question was written in 1913 by Chief Inspector John Littlechild of Scotland Yard to fellow criminologist George Sims. 
to little Charles' mind, he thought that this man could well be Jack the Ripper, and he's American, he's genuine, and we've got documentary evidence of his flight to America. Self-proclaimed Dr. Francis Tumulty is more than likely the subject described by Little Child. Dr. Francis Tumblety, who was arrested in London six weeks ago on suspicion of being the Whitechapel murderer, arrived here by the steamship Britannia on Sunday under an assumed name, Dr. Frank Townsend. Detectives were waiting for him on the dock, and they tailed him to an East 10th Street lodging house. It is not known exactly when the doctor eluded his watchers. His landlady found his room empty. A half-open valise on the chair and a big pair of English cavalry boots were all that remained to tell the story of Dr. Tumblety's flight. Tumblety used many aliases. He may well have chosen the name Blackburn to purposely align himself with an infamous Dr. Luke Blackburn a staunch confederate and instigator of nefarious plots during the time of the Civil War. Dr. Tumblety, alias Blackburn, the person who was arrested in London a week ago as Jack the Ripper, was a well-known character in Brooklyn many years ago. In the 60s, he used to walk down the street in his uniform accompanied by a big dog. April the 16th, 1865. President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. Tumulty, possibly mistaken as the infamous Confederate Dr. Luke Blackburn, was arrested. This was the report Colonel Baker gave Washington about their prisoner. All his papers were examined. He has gained an extensive notoriety as an imposter and quack, but nothing was found in them lending to implicate him with the assassination. Within a few weeks, he was released. Washington, D.C., May 26, 1865, to the Honorable E.M. Stanton, Secretary of War. Sir, I have the honor to recommend the release from custody of F. Tumblety, prisoner now at the Old Capitol. Very respectfully yours, H.G. Burnett, Provost, Colonel, and Judge Advocate. Tumblety wrote in one of his three published books, I am the most well-known person in the entire city of Washington. Who exactly was the man who kept an entire city in mortal fear and the rest of the world on pins and needles waiting for his capture, waiting for a name to be put to him? Serial killing is certainly as, as old as human society is. When you have a form of behavior that is so connected to the intimate details of childhood, and family upbringing. Uh, so for, for as long as there have been children and families, there have probably been these kind of characters. Jack the Ripper, the Phantom of Death. We don't really know who he was. We may never know. But we will speculate and wonder for another hundred years.